And today we have Wendy Moore. She is the executive director of the Moore Family Charitable Foundation. And she led Lazy Points Farm, which is focused on the New York kelp ecosystem. So I'm going to let Wendy tell us more about herself. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful to Rewild for giving kelp a seat at your table tonight. I'm always thrilled for the opportunity to talk seaweed with anyone who's interested. Um, I also want to thank Rewild for the incredible work that you're doing across Long Island to restore your communities in such a creative and healthy and beautiful way. Um, I think there's a lot of overlap in what we in the kelp community care so much about and what y'all do at Rewild. So I think it's really cool for the chance um, for us to join forces in this way. Um, my name is Wendy. I run two different nonprofit initiatives. One of them is a diaper bank in New York City called the Brooklyn Diaper Project. Uh, the other one is called Lazy Point Farms, which is all about supporting the emerging kelp industry in New York State. Uh, you might say kelp and diapers, that's pretty random. What do they have in common? Um, I chose to work on both of these projects because of their potential to make direct impact in their own ways. And over the past couple of years, I've actually learned kelp and diapers actually have more in common um, than I thought, but I'll explain more about that in a bit. Um, despite our name, Lazy Point Farms, we're not actually a farm. Um, my husband and I originally thought we wanted to start a kelp farm after reading all the incredible ways seaweed can positively impact the environment. But as we got started, the more conversations we had with local experts, the more we realized that everyone who was already growing it and studying it was facing the same set of challenges and weak points in the space. So I realized that I'd be better off focusing my time and effort by supporting the expertise that was already alive and well on, Long on in New York. In three years, we have supported over 20 different kelp programs. We've helped New York's first commercial growers receive their permits. We are helping at every stage of the game from improving hatchery setups to permit challenges to end use challenges. Um, a lot of people ask me what my goal is for our kelp project. Uh, I know a lot of nonprofits operate in a way that helps them continue to exist, but our goal is actually to invest our time and funding in a way that helps the industry get on its feet so that we wake up one day and the community doesn't actually need us anymore for this work. And we're operating the same way with the diaper project. I like to describe our efforts as helping New Yorkers own their most urgent opportunities. So the money we raise and all the progress we make is going right back into solving the problems rather than running our program. Uh, final thing before we get started, I've learned so much about kelp over the past four years, but I don't consider myself an expert at all. Uh, I work su to support the expertise that's already alive and well here in New York. So if you have questions and I'm not able to answer them, there's a good chance I might not know the answer, but I love a good question and I would love to look into it and get back to you. So what is sugar kelp? Uh, rather than me launching right into what it is, I'd like to ask all of you, is there something you know about it that you'd like to share or what's something you don't know but are curious about and want to learn? If there's anything right off the bat, otherwise I'll dive in. Okay, I'll dive in. Um, so sugar kelp is not a plant, it's a protist. Uh, it's a macroalgae, which is different from seagrass. Um, it's reproductive tissues wild harvested in very small amounts. Uh, in order to farm it, you need to take a small section of a single kelp blade into a lab to induce the reproductive phase. So in a controlled setting, the spores can then attach to a string that's woven around a PVC pipe, uh, something that looks like a big spool of thread, like what's pictured in this slide. So it grows in this setup for about five weeks and then is brought out to our local waterways and attached to sturdier lines and is set up with buoys and anchors. And then it grows over the course of the winter and harvested in the spring. So it's kind of backwards from a traditional garden setup. How does it grow? One of the easiest ways to spot the difference between seaweed and seagrass is how they root themselves. So kelp starts off growing really slowly in the early winter, but it starts to grow really quickly um, as the season goes on. So towards the end of the growing season, you get this really exciting growth. Uh, it can get up to 16 feet long in some places and can grow as quickly as two and a half inches per day. Uh, you can't leave it in the water for too long um, when it gets warmer because it starts to disintegrate um, when the water temperatures get warm enough. So here, the kelp that grows naturally is found in waters that are relatively a little bit cooler and deeper. Uh, you can find seaweed growing wild in limited areas around Long Island. Um, so it, it is, it's around. Um, I'll talk about wild harvesting and rewilding in just a little bit. Um, so this process is a lot different than going to the store and buying seeds in a packet. Uh, as it grows, it develops something called holdfasts, which cling onto the rope. And then the rope is suspended near the top of the water and it grows down. Whereas when it grows in the wild, it attaches to rocks and floats upward. 
um, like on the picture all the way to the left. So some types of kelp have um, gas pockets, which allow them to float. So every type of kelp kind of has a little bit of a different design um, so that it can do what it needs to do. Uh, I want to emphasize just how versatile seaweed can be throughout its life cycle. Uh, because it absorbs nutrients and chemicals from our waterways, depending on where you grow it, it can either produce food or clean the waterways as a phytoremediator. Uh, on the right here, you see an image of one of the growers we support who grows kelp in New York City. Um, and then there are more common end uses like food products and gardening products. And you can take it even one step further and process it into things like fabrics and biofuels. Um, there are really so many amazing reasons to grow kelp and there's really a lot of potential. So here is a photo of one of the programs we've supported. Um, the town of Hempstead has a great program, which is a good example of how towns can support other nonprofits and clubs that want to grow kelp. Uh, when we encourage new growers to start farming kelp, we're not just encouraging commercial growers in order to boost the economy and make products. There are so many reasons to grow it. Uh, kelp actually has something in common with your group's aims because it's a natural way to bring biodiversity to waterways in the wintertime. Uh, the biodiversity is not as rich as you might find in a more permanent kelp forest because the farm is temporary, but it's seasonal availability in the same ways that a summer garden will attract animals more when it than when it and then it dies back. Um, I don't know whether anyone has studied the effects of kelp farming on biodiversity uh, in winter here, but I know it's been studied in other populations, and that's something I'd really like to see. Um, another great thing about kelp, it takes up carbon, which is known to drive up pH and water, so kelp helps with ocean desidification. Biologically, algae is more efficient than trees at capturing carbon, and it doesn't burn when you have forest fires because it's underwater. Um, it also sucks nitrogen and heavy metals out of polluted waterways, so it acts like a sponge. Uh, kelp has also been cited as carrying potential to help reduce storm, storm surge by planting it along coastlines. It can act as a buffer against the damage that coastal storms can bring. Uh, now, that's a lot of really positive things about kelp. I'd be misleading you if I said it was the ultimate solution to all of our challenges. Um, I line them all up because, you know, it sounds very promising, but the reality is we would need to grow much, much more of it to see effective results. Um, but you can make small, important, impactful changes locally where you are growing, um, and it has so much potential. So kelp has been around for 23 million years. Um, it's responsible for some of the most significant developments of humankind. Today, we think of our architectural achievements and inventions that have helped get people from one place to another, like cars and bridges. Uh, kelp was do doing this 20,000 years ago. There's a theory that the kelp highway helped humans migrate across the Pacific Rim to America, and that they didn't migrate over land after all, but by water in boats. So there's this rich trail of biodiversity, and these people were able to sustain themselves along the way because of all the mar rich marine life that kelp brought to it. Um, I like to bring up the history and the partnership that kelp has had with humans for tens of thousands of years, and then invite you to consider what kelp would think if it were a person and could hear the kinds of discussions we were having about it today, like whether or not it's useful, whether or not more of it belongs in our waterways, despite the fact that human activity has caused its decline. Um, we're finding ways to bring it back to help try and reverse some of the damage we've caused, and um, the governor isn't convinced we should be growing a lot of it yet. She thinks it's premature, which to me feels like a little bit of an ironic use of the word, given that it's been growing for 23 million years. Um, the fact that we can grow it in a relatively few number of areas in New York is a really big hurdle in our efforts to be able to grow it enough um, to be able to see some of the benefits. In the four short years I've been doing this, I have a waiting list of more than 50 growers long of people saying, hey, I'd really like to grow kelp. And for most of them, I have to say, I'm really sorry, you can't grow it yet, or you might not be able to ever grow it just based on where they are in the water. Um, and it all has to do with just, you know, where it's allowed to be grown at this time. So how does seaweed relate to gardening? I'm not going to get into the details of this slide. It's a screenshot of an article that reviews all the different benefits that seaweed has on various plants, um, parts of plants. Um, these aren't all the effects of sugar kelp specifically, but it gives you an idea of how the relationship between sea life and plants has such potential. Um, it can be introduced into the soil or sprayed onto the plant itself. Uh, my favorite benefit of seaweed in soil is its ability to hang on to moisture in the soil, reducing the need to water as frequently. Uh, dried seaweed can absorb up to 10 times its weight in water, so antioxidants and micronutrients and hormones aside, even just the basic property of improving drought tolerance to, in plants to me is the coolest part about adding kelp to your garden. Um, 
And my favorite part about using seaweed in general in this way is how it helps close the nitrogen loop. Uh, kelp takes nitrogen out of the waterways from runoff and it you put it back in the soil and you're closing that loop by replacing not lost nutrients. Um, it also hopefully can then start to encourage people to adopt use of these materials rather than importing synthetic fertilizers, which people are bringing extra nitrogen onto the island, um, which end up in our waterways. So that's yet another benefit we hope to see as growers start to ramp up supply. So yeah, this photo is just kind of a, you know, everything on the top above the soil is kind of all the different benefits you can see from adding different types of um, macroalgae. Um, so it's just kind of a meta study. And I just, I thought it was a really just good um, visual to kind of show all the things that people have looked at and, and all the different benefits. Uh, there are a lot of ways you can go about adding kelp to your gardens. We haven't had a chance to rigorously test all the ways yet. Uh, this is all really stu new stuff for New York, but we're so excited. There are some folks who are interested in working on this. Um, very generally speaking, you can dry it and add it to soil. You can reconstitute the, the dried ground kelp back into the water and use it as a foliar spray, or you can add it wet and ground into the soil as compost or wet and whole blade, like just the, the whole blade of kelp, and then let mother nature do the mechanical work of breaking it down. You can also ferment it and make a tea out of it. You can strain the liquid and spray it onto plants. Um, so there are a lot of options. Um, and, uh, you know, people have been doing it in various ways for a very long time. Um, sugar kelp has so many beneficial growth hormones and trace nutrients and minerals. We're just beginning to better understand. Uh, but this practice has been used for centuries. Um, if plain old seaweed had a listing on Amazon in the, in the garden and outdoor section as a garden product, um, and if Amazon had been around for a few centuries, kelp would have a list of good reviews for hundreds of years back. Um, it's a well-established tried and true addition to gardens. A lot of people have been using it for a long time. And that's just the basic building block of kelp itself. We haven't even begun to see all of the exciting developments that people can take this product and further optimize it even more uh, for be even better results. Um, I wanna show you a quick photo of some accidental success I had with kelp in gardening. Back in 2020, our family spent a lot of time learning about kelp, getting our hands on it, learning how it changes once you take it out of the water. We had hundreds of pounds of it. And by the third batch, we were getting really tired of hanging it overhead. So we started draping it over our playground set. My kids were not thrilled with that um, across our hammock. And about two weeks after we hung it over the hammock, we had grass growing in places that were totally sandy before. Um, now I realize I'm admitting I um, it's not very rewild of me to get rid of the weeds and grasses that grow in my yard but it was an area where our kids played. So we kept an area of sand free of native plantings as a way to minimize um, ticks and ground wasps and them getting into to that. So this story is a testament to challenge the idea that we don't always you know, need to study things you know, for years and years or patent them. Sometimes we have a tendency to kind of overcomplicate things and really, you know, a lot of times we can just try simple things that have been happening for hundreds of years, which is kind of you know, a brilliant strategy in its own. Um, and to be honest, this wasn't a scientific investigation and whether coming off, you know, the, whatever coming off the seaweed wasn't an ideal concentration of what you'd hope. Um, but the little bits of kelp and things falling down, I think you could make a rough case that whatever grass was there liked what it got. Um, so you can see the pattern kind of under the hammock of where the kelp was underneath the hammock. Um, I want to pause and see if there are any questions so far. I, yes, there is. And we want to know, why is it called sugar kelp? Hmm. So it has, um, oh my gosh, why is, why is the name? It's, uh, it's, it's when you dry it, there's a, what's the name of the sugar? Why am I blanking on this? Um, there's an actual, like, it, it tastes like sugar. There's like a sugar salty um, component to it when it dries when it dries. So um, actually you can see in this picture, it's actually, there's there's some salt on this dried kelp here, um, but it's it's known for the sugar content that, why am I blanking on this? Um, it's just a very simple name for sugar. Um, I will I will remember. Sucrose. I don't, what's that? Sucrose. Sucrose, oh. Um, Begins with an M, I think. I know. Manitol. Oh, Manitol. 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 Right. Yes. Manitol. <laughs> Thank That's you, it. Oscar. And, yeah. And it's actually, it's, you know, I, um, when we were drawing and grinding it, I, I was kind of, it was in some crates and I was kind of 
tapping it onto the ground and I noticed that, you know, that this white stuff that was coming off of it and I tasted a little bit and it was delicious. It's like this umami because of the umami component of seaweed plus the sugar plus the salt. It was like this incredible all seasoning kind of very interesting mixture and it's it's really difficult to know how you might process it because you get such a small amount for such a large amount of kelp but to know how to kind of get that off of the kelp and i mean it's really cool stuff um and actually um i think i was we were just having the conversation last friday um james um about the fact that people are really interested in sugar kelp because of its sugar content um and its potential for uh fermentation um, as that quality. So that's kind of an interesting component too. So uh, where is the agricultural kelp source? There's a, you mentioned a place that it can be produced and bought? Per, in, on Long Island or? Yes. Anywhere. Oh. Well, so currently, I mean, it's a very, very new, so this is more about this slide right here. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll explain this slide because it, it gets into the fact that the, uh, the economy here is very, very new. Um, okay. You can, yeah. And it's a very small portion of the, the worldwide economy. So, so that's a good, that's a good, I'll, I'll just, I'll head into the slide and we'll see if that answers some things. Um, so currently kelp is not um, a part of the New York economy because New York saw only saw its first commercial permit issued last year after the harvest season was over. So it hasn't even been possible to sell it until now. Worldwide, Asia is by far the lar largest player in the global seaweed economy, which supplies 70, 97% of the world seaweed, uh, only 1% in the U.S. So I'm averaging the projections I've seen that seaweed will become a $20 billion industry by 2030. And sugar kelp isn't really a significant part of that story yet, as people are really only beginning to understand its potential. Uh, I mention this because I want to emphasize it's a really big sandbox right now with so much room to grow. Um, there's just so much, so much opportunity for um, creativity and, you know, starting something new um, as a business. And once we start to see development of both supply and demand, many local oyster growers will be able to enjoy a second income from this crop, which grows right alongside their existing crop. Sugar kelp holds a lot of potential in its economic value. Um, it can be used to produce a variety of things like gardening products. It can be used in food, additives to things like toothpaste, bio, biofuel, plastics, and fabric. You wouldn't add biofuel as an additive, but that was just a list of one of the things. Um, and it's a potential part of the economy that won't burden our existing resources because it doesn't require any chemicals, fresh water, or land to grow it. It just grows and clean things up as it grows, which is kind of brilliant. Um, and so that's all just the traditional economy. So most people just talk about the economy in terms of, you know, that, that aspect, but I care about subsistence economies too, locally where groups can grow it and use it locally to benefit their local neighborhoods in cases where they might not otherwise be purchasing a product. Um, I also think it's an important part of the learning economy. So seaweed is a tool in education. I think kelp is a powerful educational vehicle to teach advocacy, ecosystems, biodiversity, biology, climate justice, material science, chemistry, even local government. Um, I think, you know, it, it's also just fine to pursue kelp for the sake of growing it. There's something really powerful about growing something and creating something new with your neighbors. And I think that's probably something you've seen with your project as well. So I love this slide. Uh, the New York State kelp community is really unique because of its people. Uh, pictured here is a team of commercial growers, scientists, and nonprofit stakeholders all coming together on a research project a couple of seasons ago. Uh, we aren't only focused on supporting private commercial growers. So when I talk about our kelp community, I have conversations with teachers, Girl Scouts, garden clubs, architecture students, artists, scientists, municipalities, legislators, rotary clubs here today on the call, and commercial growers. Um, I talk to growers in clean food grade waters who want to help grow kelp alongside their oyster farms for additional income and improve their health for their oysters. I talk to urban farmers who want to clean their waterways and provide a haven for the wildlife that finds itself there. Um, New York State is really lucky to have both for-profit and nonprofit hatcheries that can produce healthy schools. Uh, I think the diversity of groups and diversity of reasons why people want to grow it help contribute to its strength and potential because you get this rich network of experience and backgrounds all with a common goal of people who can build on each other's progress, um, which is something you can't achieve if you put 10 for-profit growers in a room who are all trying to keep their 
you know, progress under wraps. Um, in that case, you just don't see the kind of progress at the same rate that we've enjoyed so far. So this is a little bit about rewilding um, in the kelp world. I get a lot of questions about whether or not we work with growers who wild harvest sugar kelp or even other species that you see wash up on the shoreline. Um, and so we don't do that. We focus exclusively at this point on farming. Um, we do have to go out and wild forage small amounts for the reproductive phase. Um, but other than that, it's all farming. So you don't really see sugar kelp washing up on the shore like you see other kinds of seaweed. Uh, sugar kelp did used to grow more abundantly in our waterways, but rising temperatures is the main reason I've seen cited as why it's not found as abundantly growing wild today. Uh, most of our work is focused on farming it and protecting what's currently there. Um, since this talk is to an audience interested in rewilding, I'll mention that a local group a few years ago uh, was working on a method to add kelp material to rocks and sinking them to the bottom um, of the sound. Uh, Greengravel.org um, is a, a project working on that. I did. I tried contacting them because I thought it'd be cool to get more information for this presentation. I didn't hear back, so I don't know if they're active. But if you look on this slide, if you see the black rock all the way to the left, um, can you guys see? I don't know what your screen. It, it kind of, does it extend all the way? Do you see the rock? Yes, we do. So, you see how the hold fast kind of attaches to the rock there. And so basically they develop it so that they can sink the rocks to the bottom. Um, and that's, yeah, that's basically the, the root system and how the kelp anchors itself in place. So this is not an active project, but people have done it before and have tried. So if you're inspired by what you've heard so far, is this the right slide? Hold on a second. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the right slide. Um, if you're inspired by what you've heard so far and you want to help, um, I think the biggest thing you can do is make room for it in conversations. Um, seaweed is not well understood in New York State and sugar kelp is even less well understood. I think a lot of people, um, it's going to, you know, a lot of people think it's going to taste like nori or ulva or wakame, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but those are kind of the more well-known seaweeds that you more likely tasted. Um, if you're a grower, definitely, you know, if you know anybody who wants to grow it, please get in touch because there's a matter of what water body you're in and the permitting involved. Um, but really the most powerful impact you can have is to make space for it in conversations and encourage people to contact us and we can, you know, make connections however we can. So what progress have we made? Um, we have helped improve the hatcheries by purchasing equipment to improve their setups and facilitating communication among all of them to help improve their setup and practices. We're learning more about where it can grow and how to set up gear and make it more efficient. We have made good progress in analyzing it to understand food and safety. We've made really big progress with permits. Um, when I started making dead end phone calls back in 2020, trying to get started to find a way to help this industry, I remember one of the first people I spoke to said, don't even bother, don't quit your day job. The permitting situation for new kelp farms is so complicated and there's no way forward right now. Uh, luckily, I'm quite stubborn and I did not take that advice. And I was also very lucky that David Berg was so generous with his time and expertise, someone we've worked with very closely over the past few years. Uh, New York State owes its permitting successes to David, who has tire tirelessly worked behind the scenes for years to help so many growers successfully submit their applications. Um, he's pinpointed and helped overcome all the hurdles with what we've seen um, coming from the agencies. Um, so that's been a really big success, I think, um, that's paved the way. Uh, we're also making progress in getting kelp into classrooms, getting it into a wide variety of conversations. So we're just plugging away little by little. Uh, we hope that with these first few permits that have been issued, this will pave the way for more permits to be cleared more quickly and efficiently and that growers will continue to learn from each other on local conditions so that even more growers can understand how to grow it successfully. So really our, our success so far has just been, you know, connecting the dots and finding the pain points and kind of working on those one by one. Uh, so this industry has several big hurdles that it needs to clear. Uh, one of the biggest ones relates to climate uncertainty. We are at the Southern end of the border for growing sugar kelp and the seasons are only getting warmer. Uh, you might wonder how warmer temperatures affect growth. So the reproductive cycle of native kelp only starts to appear once the temperatures drop. Uh, the longer we have to wait to harvest the kelp, the, long, the shorter the growing season will be. So growers are putting in the same amount of effort for less product. 
Um, remember when I mentioned the kelp grows quickly towards the end of the growing season. So every day really counts towards the end of the season. And then you've got, you know, warmer temperatures, you've got this pressure to get it out of the water so it doesn't start to foul. So the earlier you can start, the better. Um, that's why we're really hopeful about introducing gametophytes into our hatcheries, where we can take what's naturally growing and surviving in warmer temperatures with strains specific to our re region and retain it in the hatcheries year round for more reliable seasons. Um, it also allows us to develop and use the strains that um, are going to start evolve to evolve to adapt to warmer temperatures. So another challenge to the kelp community faces in New York State is uh, supply and demand, basically. Um, sugar kelp is relatively less well understood than other types of seaweed, both locally and globally. And in order for a healthy marketplace to emerge, you need a lot of kelp in order to, for businesses to start to, you know, take our local industry seriously. Uh, we're envisioning a future with a hybrid of localized and also centralized um, cooperative or town-owned processing facilities um, as kind of the ideal setup. So localized and that it's not just like one facility in Riverhead where everyone has to drive their kelp, which is really heavy um, to one location, but also centralized enough that more than one grower can utilize um, the equipment and the space. Um, ideally, you would have kind of a cluster of people who could utilize the spaces. Um, so yeah, that's that's one of the, the big things that we're working on is trying to figure out, you know, where can these where can these locations live and who can utilize them? So challenge number three, the final challenge I want to mention is the need for local innovation and inspiration. Um, again, this comes back to educating people on the potential in all sectors and getting them interested and helping them get started. There are so many incredible things you can do with kelp, and there are so many creative and talented people out there who are full of ideas. Uh, some of the products that get made will require more sophisticated processing, which takes infrastructure and machinery to build out those solutions. And we're definitely here to, you know, support that when it develops and comes up. But there are so many other products and solutions that don't require anything highly expensive or technical. And it's um, really about spreading the word and starting the conversation and letting people know about help and that it's here and that, you know, it's there's so much potential. Um, as an example of how I hope kelp will catch on. Um, I hope I get more and more of these emails. Um, yesterday, an architecture student from Parsons here in New York City asked me if he I could send him five pounds of kelp because he wants to look at how um, he can maybe make concrete out of kelp. Um, I got so excited because concrete's one of our biggest contributors of carbon emissions, and adding kelp to it actually can counteract that, and um, it also emits less heat than concrete you use um, growing, you know, using traditional concrete. Um, so by mixing it into new building structures, it's just really a, a cool, um, cool idea. So the innovation is out there, you know, the, the potential is out there. So it just starts with very simple conversations and spreading the word and getting kelp a seat at the table whenever possible. So I want to highlight one of the ways we're addressing this third challenge I mentioned of needing innovation and inspiration, and that's getting kelp into classrooms, not just in New York State, but nationwide. Um, I think classrooms rec represent tremendous potential and that students aren't bound by a need to publish a paper or win grant money or turn a profit. They can just innovate and study real world applications uh, for kelp. My hope is that some of our best local ideas come out of our classrooms in the next five years. Uh, this is a photo of a student in a local high school. They posted this on Instagram um, on Long Island who asked for some dried kelp because she wants to make biochar as a way to clean water. And this is the first I've heard of anybody doing this kind of work locally. And I'm, I'm just kind of blown away by the example she's setting for what can be done and blown away by her teacher who reached out to me to see what was possible. Um, my background is actually in education. And I recently wrote a kelp curriculum, which I posted on our website for anyone to use. So if anyone's interested in bringing kelp into their classrooms or camps or um, any groups at all, please feel free to reach out. Um, I would love to discuss further and, and tailor it to whatever your situation is. Um, I think learning about kelp is such a good start to the conversation of how to integrate kelp meaningfully into our communities. And I think it belongs in every conversation we're having about waterways, our economy, anything having to do with building a creative, positive future. So a second way we're addressing the third challenge of needing innovation and inspiration is by leading by example. 
We are really excited to be working with the Fashion Institute of Technology's non-woven textiles department this coming year um, to develop a prototype for a seaweed and oyster shell diaper. Uh, you might remember I mentioned in the beginning that I run a diaper project. And one of the most frustrating things about that is having to purchase diapers that were made for profit and then you have to give them away again. Um, I think there's a way to develop low cost materials made of oysters and kelp to make hygiene products. Um, as it turns out, if you chemically break down oyster shells, you get a super absorbent material that's the same or more absorbent than what you can find in today's disposable diapers. And kelp can be made into non-woven fabric and also has incredible potential as an absorbent material. So there's just, there's a lot to explore. And I think at this stage, it's important that, you know, whether or not this takes off and, you know, just revolutionizes the world, which I don't, you know, I don't know, but um, it's important people start making prototypes and having these conversations to help make these possibilities start to feel like they're right in front of us. Um, as we think ahead to our futures, we really need to be thinking about how to utilize the 70% of the earth that we know barely anything about. You know, the ocean is just, it's there and there's so much potential there. Um, not only, you know, how we can use it responsibly to help meet our increasing needs for food and materials, not only that, but those materials can work in our favor as they grow. They require so little input and when they get cycled back to the earth, you know, how can we do that more responsibly than before? Um, cost of doing business in the United States in this way and in New York in particular is a big challenge, but I still think it's important that we start imagining what's possible right here um, to help gather momentum and support and insist on these solutions becoming realities. Um, and these images are not real. They're from AI. I asked, I asked AI to make me a kelp and oyster diaper, and this is what it came up with. So if these aren't actually what we're even necessarily going for, but I needed an image for this slide and I thought, okay, let's just, you know, it, it's a good, it's an interesting way to kind of imagine what's possible. Um, let's see, so I've really enjoyed the chance to talk about kelp tonight. I hope this was interesting and informative. I would love it if you reached out. Um, here are all the ways you can do that. Um, check out our websites, lazypointfarms.org, and our Instagram page has uh, more photos and kind of updates of what's happening in New York. I've also written a lot of blog posts on morgood.org. If you go to the media tab on our foundation page, you can read things I've written um, about both my diaper, the diaper project and the kelp project. And that's, that's it. Any questions? Yay. Thank you so much. That was a lot of good information and so i'm so excited I, I i want kelp to take over the world um <laughs> i would uh, i would like to ask james if possible can you say a few words on what you're doing uh locally on the kelp program certainly thank you very much um uh, well we kind of uh backed into uh sugar kelp uh fortuitously uh, wasn't exactly by accident, but uh, I run a local rotary club uh, called REACH, and it's the uh, Rotary Environmental Action Coalition of Huntington. And, and our uh, main focus has been uh, building oyster reefs. And I found out, or we found out, that oyster reefs and sugar kelp uh, go really, really well together. And uh, Sugar kelp is 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 grown in the off season, so we started uh, talking about you know how could we possibly get into this sugar kelp uh, project. And uh, Wendy appeared, and all the pieces came together. Our local government is very very uh, enthusiastic about it. The town of Huntington, um, Cornell Cooperative Extension Marine Program, uh, and and Rotary have formed a partnership that is uh, doing oyster reefs, sugar kelp, native plants, and half-shell recycling. So the sugar kelp uh, project is uh, really getting getting big. Uh, we've got, last year we did a, a, a pilot project uh, with just two 100-foot lines, uh, and then we were able to get uh, permits from New York State, DEC, and Army Corps of Engineers uh, to grow kelp in seven sites in Huntington Water. Uh, so we will have uh, 1,400 feet of sugar kelp lines. We have it out there now, uh, and it's 
growing beautifully. Uh, we were just uh, featured in uh, Newsday, actually. Uh, last week, there was an article in Newsday in Our Towns. Uh, I'd be happy to send you a uh, a copy of, of, of that. So we're really excited about growing and harvesting kelp for our town parks and golf courses and offering and offering it to local gardeners as a soil amendment uh, and biostimulant. That's one of the things that uh, I, I, as I learn more about uh, the the positive benefits of kelp, it just it, it blows me away. Um, and we're digging deeper and deeper into the science uh, and the various applications. Uh, but right now, what we're focusing on uh, is our lawns and golf courses and uh, and gardens for our parks and our uh, local gardeners. So there's a really nice uh, uh, connection here to uh, rewild Long Island too that I'd like to explore uh, more. Yes, and kelp is a much, much better alternative than fertilizer or synthetic fertilizer that's commonly used in these fast lawn and golf course. Yeah, um, one of the things that we're going to be doing once we harvest it, we we have a greenhouse uh, on town property uh, where we would be drying the kelp uh, and then uh, shredding it and and milling it, uh, getting it down to a a powder for use. We're thinking about uh, various ways of uh, processing it to uh, make a tea, uh, make a liquid, uh, liquid form and a solid form uh, to you know, really be able to uh, be versatile for all sorts of uh, various applications. And one of the things that we're 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 doing in our native plant project uh, is uh, looking at ecotype plants, uh, pollinators uh, that will be uh, uh, growing uh, in our in our uh, greenhouse, along with where we dry and process and store our kelp product. That is so amazing. Um that it is going on locally. Do you, um, or Wendy, do you have a map of where kelp is allowed to grow on Long Island or in New York State? Our growers right now are in, you know, there's Huntington, um, in Hempstead, the Great Great South Bay. I don't have a map, but I have kind of a description of kind of where, where things are in process, where they're um, possible and where they're not possible. You can send that to us um, later and we will post that up along with the video. Yeah, I'll yeah. definitely do that. It's got a good just kind of summary of kind of, you know, what the current state of, of things is. Uh, once again, um, thanks to David Berg who pulled all of that together. And so that's a, a good handy um, resource. So I'll I'll find that and, and circulate. Great. That's great. Gloria, you have a few questions. Do you want to just say that? Paul? Sure. Um, why do kelp and oysters do well together? Do they have uh, do they have similar aquatic requirements? They're they're in opposite seasons, or I can try to take a stab at that. I think my understanding is because it reduces um, acidification, it helps the shells grow stronger. I know that's one of the the reasons that I've heard cited. There might be there might be more, um, and I can certainly look into that too, um, or maybe. Someone else on the call might know as well, but that's that's the one that's one of the things I've heard. I'll take a little stab at it. One of one of the the, the benefits is that uh, the kelp grows from basically November or December through to April and May, uh, and and it's a perfect complement, uh, something to do in the off season for oysters and oystering. Um, we got into kelp primarily for uh, extracting excess nitrogen and carbon dioxide from the, uh, uh, from, from the, the water. Uh, so that was part of our uh, mission uh, is to improve water quality and kelp, and kelp certainly does that, uh, but it does, you know, so much more. So really it's kind of a, uh, it's a great kind of no brainer way for people who have the boats, who have the equipment, who uh, want to be out on the water, uh, to go out on the water and hopefully, you know, monetize the waters in the winter months when instead of, you know, driving an oil truck or, 
uh, snowplow, especially when there's no snow. Is there a market of a uh, profitable market for kelp? And what is the uptake on um, on kelp as fertilizers by commercial landscapers or um, or golf courses? They seem to be driving a lot of decisions that consumers make. Yeah. And that's the big, you know, it's it's been shown, you know, worldwide, definitely it's, you know, projected to be a $20 billion industry um, in the next few years worldwide. So there's definitely potential. I think um, currently there is not, you know, a reliable supply and then therefore it's hard to drum up demand. So there's this big chicken and egg problem we have right now where we need to really, you know, we need to convince a lot of growers to, you know, fill out their permits and get the kelp in the water. And then we can start to develop the supply and then we can start to attract both bigger industries, you know, if they're interested. And also locally, we can start to really get it into the hands of people who want to make something with it. Um, so not yet, but that's the hope is really to kind of, you know, spin up the the flywheel of, of the that whole process. Oh, sorry, you had a second question. Is there uptake from or interest from um, lands, professional landscapers because they really help drive consumer demand? Yeah, I have I have heard that there is, yes. And I, I do know that also just even existing farms and um, wineries um, love kelp. And that's just a, an integral part of their practice that they would love to see more of. So that's something I know for sure. What does it? What does the kelp taste like? Does it have a a, a flavor or a taste, a scent it, that that continues on after it's been um, processed? It's a it's a very strong, nutritious flavor. That's how I like to describe it. Um, have you ever had kombu before? Yes. So it's it's basically it's kombu. It's this, it's similar. So you can you can make it into um, you know a broth, or you can use it you know as a spice or seasoning. Um, Say you're putting it on a, a golf course or something like that. Does it make the golf course smell like kombu? I I don't think so. I've used it as a you know a dried ground um, product, and no. Okay. I don't. I mean, at least I don't think. So. I mean, unless you know someone else on the call that's used it does. But I I've never noticed that. Um, I notice it more if you know with other mulches. I think you can smell you know that just, but not not kelp. Okay. We're we're hoping to really give it a good uh, a good test all throughout Huntington, uh, residential lawns, golf courses, parks, uh, and gardens. Uh, we we had uh, some experience uh, with it uh, last year in in just basic tomato gardens, and people everybody said, "Wow, it was really a great a great additive and made a, made a big difference." So we're we're really looking forward to you know doing the science and having the practical uh, experience uh, with it this this year. I am looking forward to the result of that experiment. <laughs> so Wendy, there's a question for you. Would you have your curriculum in other languages to be of interest because the world needs information on kelp? You know, the hope is that, yeah, I mean, as the more people that could use it, the better. And, you know, the way I drafted it was that it, it's not just for coastal communities either. And so it's really new, you know, I, there's, there hasn't been a lot of feedback on it or, you know, whether or not it's been useful. So I haven't gotten a lot of feedback. I think I might want to see, you know, kind of how it goes um, first locally and, you know, just seeing how it goes from there and then seeing maybe what, what components of it might want to be translated. But um, that's a very nice that, that, yeah, that's, that's a wonderful opportunity. Um, yes. And how does, how do anybody go about getting a permit or who do we have to talk to in order to get this going at our town or um, our local government? I mean, do you have personal experience on that? James, if you can pitch in on what you did, uh, that would be greatly appreciated on how we can get started at a local level. Well, uh, we have to, uh, you have to rely on the experts uh, and Dave Berg uh, is, is, is a wonderful resource and, and, uh, and is able to help us and, and, uh, uh, but Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, and the, the help community and the aquaculture community, um, you know, the fact of the matter is that, that our folks in, in the DEC are so busy and so understaffed 
that you might have the greatest project in the world and it, it, they just can't get to it uh, to to study it and to uh, you know get the permit. Uh, so you know we we I think we were we were lucky. All the all the stars were aligned and and we were one of uh, three growers in New York State uh, that are are permitted uh, to cultivate uh, not just for uh, you know, a pilot project or just for research, but uh, for use. Uh, Hempstead, town of Hempstead, town of Huntington, and uh, Violet Cove Farms in, in East Mauritius. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the Shinnecock kelp farmers have been doing it for, for a long time, for thousands of years. So we have a <laughs> lot to learn from them. Um, I just met them last week, and they are they are lovely, lovely people. And um, I'm really looking forward to being, you know, in this kelp community. And, uh, so everybody helps everybody. Uh, Could I uh, add a word? This is David Berg on, on terms of, uh, permitting. Um, it's a complicated process. It's not just the DEC, it's the army Corps of engineers. It's a New York state department of state. Uh, so there are a number of applications that need to be submitted. That's not to say that it's difficult. It's just time consuming. Um, but I would encourage uh, any entity that is interested to go ahead and pursue that. And I would be happy to help where I can. Um, so, yeah. Yes, that is great, David. If you can... Um... Put in your uh, contact information in the chat box. We would love to get to connect you with uh, and connect with you in order to figure out how to do this. Um, Oscar have a question. Oscar, do you want to unmute yourself and ask away? Um, maybe uh, let me start by apologizing for my rich African accent. Um, no, I'm I'm new in the U.S. and have enjoyed. Um, the gracious um, invitation and hosting of um, Huntington. Um, James has been wonderful. Wendy and you know, I had the chance to also talk to Dave on, on phone. Um, but to get to my question, um, seaweed is a wonderful thing for the ocean. Just like Wendy said, it reduces uh, the acidification, it promotes fl flora and fauna. And and there's dangers when you know so when good users are fond of a good of, of a thing, then it becomes focused for harvesting. Um. So now, how do we balance the you know the farming of it with having it out in in the wild? Like they have the California forests. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I can um. Just going back to the, the, you know, that one project that I found, I was looking into that because I, you know, I know that that's, and that's something that comes up from time to time. People say, well, what about just planting more of it? Um, I think, you know, there's the question of it, you know, being kind of dwindling on its own and, you know, population because of the warming temperatures. So can, you know, can we um, create strains and develop strains to kind of, you know, make it more resistant to these warmer temperatures? Um, and also just, you know, the, the project, the, gre the gravel project where they they were um, putting it on rocks and sinking it into the sound. I just, I think that would be my first step if I, you know, were to, to pursue it um, would be to just try to look in deeper to that project and see, you know, why did they stop or did they stop? Or are they still working on it? What, what have they learned? Um, I think that's just something I didn't get a chance to, um, you know, carry on to the finish line before this presentation, but it's, it's, I, that would be my next step the greengravel.org, I think is what it was called. Um, to, to me, what comes up, sugar kelp is just one variety of a seaweed. Um, I think resources now need to be, you know, channeled towards seaweed because we found out how good it is for the environment. And um, maybe going in the waters and finding out which other varieties of seaweed that probably go naturally, that don't even have a demand, and and maybe those can then grow, uh, be grown, and so we have 
um, sugar kelp and we have also other varieties. But there's a beauty of having sugar kelp farms because when where there are farms, there, a lot of fish show up, a lot of flora and fauna show up. And when you harvest, not everything is also harvested. There are bits and pieces that you know fall on the on the ground and into the ocean and become part of the um, the the framework there. So they they are by good uses to having farms in and of themselves together with what is in the world. Yes, that that is a great point because of the. I would call it the butterfly effect because of what we do, but you know, it's it's very rewarding to see what you could do in a very small way, have a bigger effect somewhere else and how it can translate to different things. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Oscar. Um, does anybody else have any questions? If you can just um, shout it out, uh, unmute yourself. Hi. <laughs> Um, so I also belong to a boat club in Broad Channel, and they might be interested in growing some kelp, um, you know, just sort of as a test. And I know that it's a good bioremediation, and it's probably not as clean in Broad Channel as it is in Long Island. Anyways, I just wanted to start that conversation while I'm here. Amazing. I might... Um find your email maybe I'll I'll pin you from there and go from there I'll email you tomorrow okay okay good to see you again thank you so much everybody um if you have more questions just speak up um I would just like to thank Wendy to spending the time with us and showing us what uh kelp can be and the potential in it mm -hmm.